Long before humans came into being, the land was already here, as were its animals. There were no human notions of sacred grounds, no human conceptions of gods and goddesses, no human structures to mark the places of a magical and religious nature. Yet, the land and its animals were no less sacred. There were moments in time when humans came in contact for the first time with places they thought to be sacred for whichever reason. The first conceptions of divinity, sacredness, magic, spirituality and religion even. What did our human ancestors felt in that first moment? What have they seen? What have they experienced? What led them to mark a place as a sacred spot and understand it as a piece of land inhabited by other than human and other than animal entities? There was once a time when the connection between land and animals and humans was strong and fluid, even of a magical nature. We may have forgotten the first sentiments our ancestors have felt and the events that led to perceiving the land as more than what it appears to be in such a past beyond time. And now we merely look at mythology, folklore and religion and all the stories we tell one another as a guiding path to try to reconnect with the land by visiting places that have once stood in the very center of the spirituality of our ancestors. But the true original emotions and experiences that led our ancestors to understand the land and its persons as magical and sacred lies deep in dream still. It is within the dreams of the land and the dreams of those whose burial grounds are scattered throughout the landscape and whose memories flow in stories albeit changed and twisted by historical time. Uh, that we can reawaken such emotions and experiences. Dreams of the living and dreams of the dead are the same canvas on which we paint all the interconnected lore. It is in dreams that we speak to one another, because there is neither space nor time. There's no going back or forward. There just is. Dreams are transformation the transformation of spirits that have always been here even before coming into being. There's neither death nor life as moments that mark beginnings and ends, but instead a fluid transformation of souls in a cyclical stream. Because what has come will come again. Hello my dear friends, how are you? I'm Ari Thurger and today let's just have a conversation about death. <laughs> but as transformation, from an animistic point of view. I've said here before that death is seen as a transformation, but I haven't explored much on that subject, and uh, to be honest, today it's just a brief general idea which makes it for an introductory video for future content, or perhaps a sort of a complementary video to what has been told in my latest videos uh, in my White Wand series. But anyway, Death is an obvious transformation when we think about the death of the body of several beings, be those human, animals or plants, whose bodily death provides sustenance, materials of all sorts for the construction of shelter, clothing, tools and also as other objects that can serve a magical religious function. Before questions of a certain nature, I am vegan. However, uh, my own moral values are not to be brought here into this video as I am taking on a broader perspective within animism in which the death of the bodily existence of several beings can serve a variety of post-mortem functions within animism. And deliberate death or natural death is a um, transformation nonetheless when bodily remains are deconstructed, redistributed and altered for a variety of purposes. And although veganism is found within animism, animism as a whole is a broad and diverse reality of beliefs and conceptions. Certainly, veganism can lead to animism and 
animism can certainly lead to a better understanding of veganism and therefore uh, many people, many animists eventually become vegan. However, people don't have to be vegan specifically in order to engage on an animistic lifestyle and having an animistic worldview. So, within this diversity of animistic realities, there are several celebrations towards the transformation of death towards what is implicit by the transformation of bodies into something more after death of bodies. And this leads towards a certain level of appreciation and respect for death as a process that can be manipulated and used to a certain extent uh, to further give meaning and importance to spirits as providers of materials and nutrition with their bodily death. But deliberate death isn't the only means by which transformation can occur towards a specific function. Natural death, death by old age, death simply occurring when the body is no longer capable of maintaining itself. This type of death can also be celebrated and I'm not talking about the celebration towards a conception of an afterlife existence or towards the idea of souls that shift their existence into a realm for the dead or towards conceptions of the divine or a celebration of ancestors. I'm talking about the celebration of dead bodies that die of natural causes and such bodies serve other functions that do not require an artificial interference or intervention in order to transform them, but are naturally transformed through decomposition. And the act to deliberately allowing decomposition to take place as a means to redistribute nutrients for other entities that feed on dead bodies and are also part of the ecosystem, and by such entities' means of consumption the corpse is transformed and serves another purpose within the natural life-death cycle. Decomposition is the transformation of death into decayed organic material used as a fertilizer, for instance. Well, death is an expected transformation of individuals. Rather than being seen as an end or as a natural cycle, or even rather than being seen as another passage and continuation of spirits, death is seen as a transformation that eventually takes place in one's cycle of existence. Animistic systems of belief will often focus on a cyclical progression of spirits. Therefore, death is an expected transformation of spirits which will allow them to continue on belonging to the cycle of spirits. In a way, this gives the perception that death can be survived, since it is taken as a transformation of the spirit and such a spirit will carry on within the cycle, surviving through the transformation itself and such transformation allowing the spirit to continue on transforming. If animism believes in the existence of something within bodies that carries on existing on several metaphysical levels of animation, vitality and knowledge even, this implies the continuation of conscious existence. Therefore, dreams play a key role within animistic societies. If dreams are manifestations of the conscious, and if they are also manifestations that come from the exterior but will eventually be projected into the conscious, they are part of what survives through the transformation of death. As such, dreams play several roles within an animistic understanding or worldview, because they, they are in itself metaphysical levels of existence projections of the ancestors, projections of a spirit's cycle of existence, revelations, signs, visions of interactions people have on other levels of existence other than the bodily experiences. Perhaps in this way, we understand why, within animistic societies, dreams are so important to the extent that they are even seen as expressions of the ancestors' experiences but also dreams considered to be a way of entering realms of life that are extended beyond 
ordinary human day-to-day -day experience. And if dreams are ways to experience other realms of life, perhaps it is through dreams indeed that ancestors can be encountered. Because if death is a transformation that is expected of persons, and as such persons survive death, their existence continues on, on other realms of life that can be accessed also through dreams, which may sometimes be ways of entering such realms of life, because persons are expected to transform and shift. So whatever lies within a body that is expected to transform and survive, it naturally already has this capacity to shift and transform, because it is already expected to do so at some point in life. So whatever lies within, let's call it spirit, just for a better understanding, uh, it is already predisposed to transformation and shift. It is naturally built to be able to do so. Therefore, dreams can very well be sometimes shifting into realms of life. Therefore, there's the possibility to experience things on such realms and uh, interact with its persons, dream persons. Of course, um, this is not to state that dreams are the only means through which animists establish contact with ancestors and eventually descendants. Dream enables encounter. Dream provides a possible interpretation that neither life nor death are static, and death isn't a permanent fixed state, and death is not opposed to life, but rather a transformation of persons and their relationships. An expected transformation of one's life and one's relationships with others and with the environment. But this transformation, which can certainly be quite dramatic, doesn't have to necessarily be a complete change of, of the ordinary life, as certain aspects of life pre-transformation through death can still be maintained. Not just the contact with persons through dreams as ways of entering realms of life that enable encounters, but also the role persons continuously have when their body is transformed to be used in various ways, such as the ones previously mentioned, but also the possibility of shifting bodies as a continuation of transformation of persons within the cycle of existence that eventually leads persons to come again and engage in realms of life and engage with community and even re-establish bonds of kinship. The ancestors continuously providing aid to the community through several ways, here spoken before on other videos. Uh, I'm not here to romanticize death because death isn't romantic, death isn't poetic, and the transformation of death changes everything from an individual level to the community level and environmental level. Sadly and unfortunately, uh, but I, I suppose that's the way things are. Uh, in the past, I have had a lot, or, uh, a lot of contact with death, including of human beings, literally watching them die in front of me. Now, in our Western society, for too long, death has been quite the taboo. We avoid dealing with death as much as possible. Death causes trauma, understandably, especially at an early age or when it's something quite brutal. Even though if in the long run we reach a point in our lives that it seems that we have overcome such a trauma, because it was not properly dealt with, something might trigger past memories of such a trauma and it's hard to cope with it. Trauma is repressed rather than expressed in a proper way in order to mitigate uh, the more gloomy effects it has had and may still have in our minds. In animistic societies we don't see this predisposition to turn death into a taboo, but rather death is celebrated. In animism, death isn't normalized because that too is an error, it seems to me, of course, because <laughs> by normalizing it, it strips away an understanding of it and, and meaning and purpose of, of, of it and becomes mundane, 
leading to a disconnection from death and its function in the cycle of life. Therefore, people will have a hard time dealing with death because it, it has no point in community leading people to once again not giving it a place in conversations and then trauma will be inevitable and uh, not dealt with accordingly further extending trauma through the generations throughout the, the generations and that won't do either in animism there's a celebration of death instead not a celebration of the act of dying in itself or the celebration of someone's death but rather the celebration of what is implied death as a shift in the survival of spirits death as an occurrence not opposed to life and instead enabling the cycle of existence to continue and death as a transformation those are the things that are celebrated therefore included in the vocabulary in the collective mentality and pragmatic behaviors of a society or a community and this doesn't mean, of course, that there won't be trauma caused by death within an animistic society or community, but death isn't certainly seen as a taboo, and because it is included in life, it will open up the possibility to mitigate, at least, the effects of trauma. Transformation of death is celebrated, and I think this is important to take in mind, especially for us nowadays uh, and, and for those trying to return or to have a more animistic mentality and lifestyle, especially when it comes to forms of pragmatic magic and or the traditional, in traditional folk magic, as many people use parts of dead bodies, mostly of animals, and the great majority bones, animal bones. Uh, I've seen this quite a lot and I've talked to some of such people and there, there seems to be a certain absence of an understanding of death and the non-existence of a celebration of death. People often using bones and skulls, skins and feathers and whatnot solely because it is either cool or because it has become a, a new trend within modern day folk magic and witchcraft and so people have the need to follow a trend and include certain items in their lives to feel like they belong as if the bones and skulls and such alone on themselves would do anything within the work of magic as if from such body parts some sort of power or energy can be drawn uh, for the purpose of whatever magical craft people are trying to do and that's a problem because the absence of an understanding of what death constitutes and the absence of the celebration of death and why it should be celebrated only leads people to have a collection of oddities without meaning and purpose. I am not stating that you shouldn't use such things or that such things have no power. What I am stating is that without meaning and purpose, things are just things. Whilst if there is an understanding of death as an expected transformation of persons and as a means by which uh, there's survival of life, the manner in which we transform body parts to serve as utensils of a magical nature will give meaning, purpose, power, respect towards those who have been transformed by death. And instead of having a, a piece of bone, the celebration of what death implies will fill the piece of bone with purpose, with power, because we know it is part of a being that has been transformed, not only by death, itself but the remains are also transformed giving the life of this being uh, and its existence a further meaning and purpose and therefore its celebration further extends its life on other modes of existence with within the, the cycle it's not a piece of bone that has power but rather the celebration of death that gives it a purpose and therefore a power death changes everything and the celebration of death or lack of it is what transforms what remains either in tools utensils clothing building materials magical religious objects etc or not at all and leave it to follow other cycles of transformation people either have a collection of bones for nothing more more than than, than to, to show off and pretend something which is what happens quite a lot 
or they have a set of materials and objects that indeed have a purpose and power. Depends on the understanding of the celebration of death, of course. This is often applied when we go out into the woods and find all sorts of materials for our own craft. It is not right to take it all, and it is not proper to take and give nothing back. Finding the bones or, or, or the carcass of an animal, the transformation has already begun. And it is not proper to abruptly interrupt it. Some bones can be retrieved for our craft, others remain in place to allow the transformation to carry on. And we too can play a part in that transformation. The celebration of death begins at, at that moment. The remains can be arranged in place, adding organic material to help in the transformation process and further enhancing the purpose of natural transformation through decaying. And what is taken will also be the subject of transformation, allowing the person transformed by death to have an extended role in life. This is just a rather simple example, of course, obviously, just for the sake of a better understanding. Moving on. Um, I mean, uh, funeral rites in every culture developed precisely from the ritualization of celebrating death. Since death is a major transformative process, and to this day it has come down to a generalized idea of the passing of a soul, taking into account animistic societies often see this process as a transformative cycle which permits persons to come in contact with other realms of life, particularly those of the ancestors and, of course, other spirits, it often requires an adequate negotiation with spirits to facilitate both the transformative process as well as the shifting of the spirit of the recent dead into other realms of life, as such, rituals are performed in order to facilitate the passing and also to facilitate reason with spirits and aid the, in the transformative process. And these rituals are the celebration of death, which have developed into funeral rites. One function, one basic function of funeral rites is to aid the dead on their way and new form of life. Funeral rites therefore become a celebration of death. Several past and present societies carried on funeral processions and mortuary ceremonies, usually a lot of dancing, singing and music instruments, as well as the beating and shaking of several objects in order to guide the spirit or ward off other spirits whose nature is not welcomed, as they might lead the spirits of the dead in different directions, or even to call upon specific spirits and catch the attention of entities that might aid the spirits of the dead or may take them to their rightful places. These are forms of celebrating death. The living within these mortuary ceremonies play the role of guides as well, whom in turn need other types of ceremony and or rituals to be brought back into the world of the living or into this side of the living since they guide the dead into other realms of life in which they are not yet welcomed because they are the living, such ceremonies or processions or rituals are carried out when the objective of the performance is done and guides need to come back to their ordinary lives. Even if in some cases it is of a symbolic nature only, this is the ritualization of celebrating death. Within animist or, or, or animistic societies or, or within animism, the process of death inevitably forces persons to change. Not only the dead change and need to be taken somewhere, both their physical bodies as well as the, themselves as spirit persons, but the living also pass through change. And these are several processes that require proper ceremonies and rituals. Mostly, the transformation of death requires hard and extra work from the part of the living, as the living are the ones who play an important part in getting the dead into other realms of life. But also the change the dead pass through also has several impacts on the community of the living to which the dead person belonged to. 
the community of the living changes with the parting of one of its members, but also the number of ancestors may grow with the death of someone, and it is required a place for the new ancestor in the community of the living as well. Ceremonies, rituals, processions, performances, and reenactments towards death are meant to engineer change, and this is all part of the celebration of death. This also propitiates transformation. Such rituals and ceremonies also help to comfort the living who have lost a loved one. The importance of relationships persons build with one another seems to be far, a far bigger focus in animistic societies. So I wouldn't say these are performances towards death itself, but towards the changes and transformations of relationships. All right, my dear friends, I do hope you have enjoyed this video and at the very least may it help you to change certain perspectives on death or rather on modes of life. <laughs> thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, thank you for today. Until we meet again, my dear friends, always and forever at every turn of the cycle.